Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 284th New Social Environment. I'm Jess Chen, events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Patty Chang and Malvika Jolly. We're also thrilled to have the poet G.E. Schwartz here who will read to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking, which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of settler colonialism as a part of the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy. We honor those that have lost their lives to this violence and I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Los Angeles-based artist and educator Patty Chang uses performance, video, installation, and narrative forms when considering identity, gender, transnationalism, colonial legacies, the environment, large-scale infrastructural projects, and impacted subjectivities. Her most recent multi-channel video project, Milk Debt, combines the act of lactation with people's unspoken fears. Chang teaches at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. She is joined by our very own lovely Malva Kajali, a writer living between New York and Chicago. She is the events associate at the Brooklyn Rail, and a regular contributor to the South Side Weekly, where she focuses on local culture and community history. Malvika, take it away. Thank you so much, Jess, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, Patty, welcome. We're so hyped to have you. Uh, how are you doing today? How's your How's your Monday? Oh, I'm doing pretty well. I had, was teaching today, so I, had, I, was, I was telling y'all earlier that I had to take a little nap before coming on here, so. <gasps> Happy to see everyone. Hi, Martha. Hi, Martha. Um, I feel like before we get right into it, and uh, Patty, you have like a beautiful presentation that we're just going to get right into. But before we get into it, I feel like um, there is something interesting about, so recently we've been having a lot of conversations with artists that are about works that are being mediated through the space of Zoom. And there's something kind of eerie and delightful also that we're having these conversations in the Zoom space as well. Um, so like, so excited to have you from across the country. Um, and yeah, let's just get right into it. So uh, the subject of today's conversation is your work, Milk Debt. It's up right now uh, at Pioneer Works until I, I believe May 23rd. And we're just so fascinated. So Patty, can you tell us uh, how did this project take root? Um, sure, yeah. Um, Malvika, do you want me to start sharing my screen and just talk a little bit about it before we we get into that. Yeah, please. I'll address those things. Okay, cool. All right, just one sec. Where's my cursor pine? Hold on. She's going. Uh oh, somehow my cursor is invisible. Just a sec. I'm going to try to get it to share. No. Okay, hold on one minute. I'm going to try that again. If that doesn't work, Patty, I can pull up what I have on my desktop. Um, I don't know what's happened. All of a sudden, my cursor disappeared. It's <laughs> always when weird. we need it. Which is totally weird. Um, well, maybe I think this is a great moment for maybe Nick to pull up the slides, if that's all right. All right, hold on one sec. Let me just, okay. My cursor's back. Let me try one more time okay. before you go, just because I want to see if I can get my cursor back. I feel like this is the magic of the live event. Yeah. So okay, like my cursor is, my finger is pointing, so. It's a good sign. Okay, here it is. All right. All right, do you see a giant cityscape? Okay. All right, so um, 
So I moved to LA about four years ago um, and I lived on the East Coast most of my adult life. A lot of that was in New York. And um, so, you know, four years ago, um, I became really aware about this uh, fragile relationship between man-made and natural landscapes um, around us. I mean, I was already working on that before, but it was just really present. And um, of course, in LA, there's no way to get around without a car. Um, the local water source does not sustain the 10 million plus population. And there's a perpetual drought as well as, um, you know, temperatures can reach into the triple digits quite regularly in LA in the summer. Um, and also, uh, which I didn't realize, I guess, before I came was that um, there were yearly wildfires and, and it filled the LA basin with smoke. Um, so the city's uh, history of growth um, and prosperity is linked to, was linked to a complex system of aqueducts and dams that were geoengineered during the 20th century, which is the main um, period of growth for the city. And in order to control this extreme flooding, um, during the early part of this, uh, the century, um, the city cemented uh, the Los Angeles River into a, a sort of an aqueduct which flows um, directly out to the, the ocean uh, at Long Beach, which is south of the city. So um, I moved in about 2017 and in the, two th the summer of 2018, I became really um, overwhelmed by um, anxiety in relation uh, to climate change and feelings of the environment, as well as you know the political situation that was happening um, in the U.S. at that time, and so um, I decided that I should, based on a recommendation from a friend, uh, make a list of everything I was af afraid of. And at the time, I was researching um, at the Huntington Library um, in San Marino, California, which is a wealthy suburb that's not far from my house. Henry E. Huntington's grandfather, um, the person you know who um, who this place is named after, um, he was one of the four uh, railroad tycoons who built the transcontinental railroads. So um, his grandson Henry Huntington continued to build on their family's wealth um, um, by creating and enlarging the railway structure in L.A., um, which you know turned it into the sprawling city that um, it would later become. And so the library is housed on his former estate, which is massive, this is part of the garden. Um, so that summer when I was there, um, it had 117 and uh, wildfires were burning. Um, and the research space of the library was really well climate controlled and a very comfortable 68 degrees. So this privilege of being able to control the environment was um, not lost on me in this situation. Um, so at the Huntington, like all research facilities, serious ones, uh, you can't bring your own paper. You have to take notes on the ones that they provide. So the Huntington's paper is pink. Um, it has their logo at the top. And so I sat down to make my list of fears and it ran four pages. This is the, um, the first page. Um, death, Lyra's future death, death of the human species, death of the earth, but that's irrational. Flooding, drowning in a flood, fire, burning in a fire, height, smog, 113 degrees every day, water running out, what terrible things will happen when the water runs out, what terrible things I will do when flood and water are scarce. Lyra is an old man seeing, living, feeling the apocalypse. Lyra's my son, uh, if he makes it. Uh, loss of meaning, moving forward means moving closer to death. Lemmings, sharks in the water when I see a seal. Murky water, pitch black night, drowning in the murky water. Lyra in the ocean with a floaty, pain, suffering, eating maggots. Um, so it was a really a relief to know that some of my fears were irrational, but also scary to know that these consequential things were out of, you know, out of my control. So when I printed this list um, as a zine, um, I got this response that, response that it was equally comforting as well as frightening to others um, as well. Um, in some ways comforting to know that others could feel the same way, but you know, frightening that there's so much that we um, can't control in the world and do not have answers to. So um, since about um, February, 2019, I've been working on this project, Milk Debt, um, it's multi-part video project of women pumping their breast milk as they recite a, a list of fears. Um, the fears are collected from uh, 
various communities in different geographical regions. It's a project uh, that I explore environmental and effective concerns. And this project um, creates a snapshot of the current environmental, political, and effective moment. Um, sites, of, sites of conflict over democracy, nationalism, citizenry, human rights, borders, climate change, migration, and a woman's body as a context in which the project unfolds. Um, the title refers to uh, an idea in Chinese Buddhism that a child is forever indebted to its mother for the milk she gave. Um, breast milk is created from blood when the body starts to produce the hormones prolactin and oxytocin. And oxytocin is also produced when one is in love. So in this state of love and survival, milk debt is an arrangement that binds us to our history and to the earth and is a sort of an unpayable debt. And the performances act as a type of ritual in which the performer channels the fears of others into public speech, in turn, tra in turn transforming them from individual to communal fears. Um, so with you know, many of these projects that I've been doing, I don't exactly know um, what I'm doing when I began. And you know, as this project started, where I was just writing my own list of fears, um, but once I realized also that they were relatable, I was interested in um, accumulated lists of fears. So um, fears from many people that could be uh, collective. Um, at the same time, I wanted to reconsider the act of lactation. What happens to the body when a woman produces breast milk? Um, this is a picture from my project, um, Let Down, which is a part of the Wandering Lake. And, um, you know, I've, been interested and used bodily fluids in my earlier work. And uh, breast milk was specifically pumped and discarded in this project, The Wandering Lake, uh, when I was researching the shrinking of the Oral Sea. Um, and uh, I was interested in this idea of like moving, moving the movement of water and irrigation. And um, I was weaning my child at the time uh, when I was traveling to this shoreline of the evaporating sea. Um, but I continued to pump and dump the fluids um, into containers and documenting them. Um, and, you know, I was interested in this act because of the production of the hormones, prolactin and oxytocin, um, as signals to, for the body to turn um, blood into breast milk. Um, so, you know, this production of the hormones, like I said, you know, are part of survival and um, falling in love. Um, so the release of these hormones direct the woman's body to have feelings for this baby or this new thing that um, must be kept alive. So these feelings of, are, of love are directly related to an idea of survival. Um, so in 2019, uh, I found this actress and uh, theater director, Kest uh, Kestrel Lee. Uh, she was lactating. Um, I asked her to work with me to think through lactation um, through the act of breast pumping in relation to other actions, other, you know, forms of language, also thinking. And after the first time we met to sort of talk about these ideas, um, just as, as sort of like something to do or think about for the next time I asked her to make her own list of fears. Um, and she did it while she was pumping breast milk at work. Uh, so I eventually asked other friends and acquaintances to make uh, their list of fears, and I edited together a script, you know, maybe about 10 or 12 different people, um, so that she would have material to work with. And um, in our first day of shooting, you know, she's a professional actor, so she had memorized the list, and I was ready to shoot with my camera, at, you know, and um, she put on the breast pumps, and um, when the milk starts to flow, um, she forgot her lines. And, you know, we're not certain of this relationship between the flow of milk and this flow of memory. So I obtained a teleprompter and re resumed to test out pumping while reading the list of fears. Uh, we tried it in different situations, interiors, intimate spaces, um, also spaces for expressing, uh, like this is in a recording studio in LA. Um, expressing is a term that's used for speaking in English. Um, but also for the production of breast milk. Like, you know, you say you express your breast milk. 
Later in the spring of that year, um, I was also a visiting artist at Hong Kong University, and I was invited to work with students on a project um, and to participate in a conference about land. Um, and um, uh, it was about land and geography, and that really affected Hong Kong uh, because of the limited amount. So instead of thinking literally about land, I was thinking about the states of states or emotional states of people occupying a particular space and you know in that situation occupying Hong Kong. So I worked with students at the university to gather a list of fears from their families and communities. Um, and then I uh, worked with a woman who is a school teacher and a lactation activist to perform the list. And we rehearsed it, um, uh, I edited it, um, and um, you know we would practice it and film it in uh, re a rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal spaces like um, karaoke bars. Um, and then we staged it as a live performance. Um, you can see here, it's, she's performing on the stage and there's a projection behind her um, in this sort of uh, theater, stadium seating type of theater. Um, and um, so she's reading a list of fears from people in Hong Kong um, for the audience, you know, who is also living in Hong Kong. And this date of this performance is June 8th, um, 2019. And then the next day was June 9th. Um, there was the first large protest against the extradition bill. Um, and so we performed the uh, performance, milk that performance on a uh, walkway overlooking um, the beginning of the march. Um, and then upon returning to LA, I started working with uh, people uh, in Santa Monica, LA to gather lists of people's fears um, in, in the local region. Um, we collected again from students at the local colleges and universities, local community groups. We went to the public library through social media, all sorts of different um, calls to gather the list. Um, and they were edited into scripts that were then read by performers in locations such as this is the aqueduct, um, the cascades where the water enters into the LA basin. Um, and also places like the LA river um, and the alternating between the severe floods and droughts makes it really depend, LA really dependent on the changing climate. Um, although most days, you know, we act like it's perfect. Uh, other locations included the metro, spaces of movement and um, flow as well. Um, and then once the pandemic hit and the city shut down in the quarantine, um, the performances migrated to be online. Um, we used video conferencing platforms like Zoom, Skype, FaceTime. Um, and you know these locations mirrored our physical distancing and displacement. And of course, you know, just like we're here today, it's like, you know, that's what this year held. Um, so um, I'm going to show uh, just a minute or so of the video playing. So you can see the five channels moving. This is from sort of the, toward the beginning of the piece. The whole piece is 53 minutes, so it's quite long. White supremacy movements, the collapse of constitutional democracy and the rule of law, suppression of free press, misinformation, fanatical religion. The end of reason, the end of ethical and humane values, the end of humanity. The U.S. becomes a totalitarian society. World War III, unchecked power and authority. Earthworms, seagulls, deaths. Species extinction, rising temperatures, earthquakes, mass migration and pandemics, toxic water and air, the continuing destruction of the planet. A great all-consuming fire, severe drought, water wars, mass extinction and the collapse of the food chain, mutilation, amputation, flesh-eating viruses, poisoned water and air, incarceration, torture, eviction, serious illness, loss of physical mobility and independence, dementia, dismemberment, an extended death dance, the inability to walk, the inability to function independently, loss of health care, being somewhere where there's a mass shooting, a mass shooting happening at the library where I work, being trapped in an elevator, being trapped in a parking garage, being attacked by a man, being so paralyzed I can't use my pepper spray, 
or fight back or even scream. Okay, I'm gonna stop it, it there for now. Patty, thank you so much. Um, and we're so excited to get into your uh, like meaty mammalian fabulous work. Um, I guess uh, my first question, and it's perhaps not a question, but a response is I love, right off the bat, I love so much what you were saying about how milk debt is an arrangement or a relation that binds us to our history and to the earth. Um, I feel like that reminded me of so many different like cultural meanings of breast milk and of breastfeeding that I can think of and the way that in a way breast milk, you know, that breastfeeding can be in a way culturally a way of producing like relationships of legible kinship and lineage. Like I'm thinking of kind of uh, mythologies in the Mabar. There are so many places where, you know, a mother who adopts a child produces breast milk suddenly, or, you know, there'll be some, uh, some like almost like a paternity, like a maternity uh, battle over like whether like a man has been cowardly or brave and it'll root back to like who breastfed him. Um, I guess I'm thinking so much about, you've picked such rich material with like, cultural and mythological meanings associated with milk and land. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, I know you've been working with milk and then bodily fluids for a long time now, but how did how did this sort of materiality, this uh, of like liquids of, you know, bodily fluids and, and bodies of water uh, sort of first start emerging for you as an artist? Yeah, I mean, I showed those couple images of the discarded breast milk from Uzbekistan. And I think that I mean, I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm like, a lot of it, it was circumstantial, you know, um, and so I guess the material meaning um, came from an experiential um, learning, you know, um, like I was really interested at the time um, about, you know, the movement of water um, and the manipulation of the movement of water. And, you know, I, I just by chance, you know, was, had given birth and was, you know, like going through this process of um, lactating, breastfeeding and breast pumping as well. Um, and so like the combination between like the caregiving and also this, you know, research that I was doing um, and then going to this place, um, it sort of like, you know, culminated with those two actions like unfolding at once. And um, I was sort of struck by, you know, the thing with the RLC is that, you know, they had um, irrigated the water out for agricultural reasons. So the sea had shrunk a lot, like 80% or something. Um, and so I was interested, you know, in the overlap of um, the, the sort of the loss of flow of, um, of the, the body of water. And then, you know, my, you know, condition moving through the land um, and also thinking about, um, the land and the water, you know, while my body is like, you know, in, in some sort of like reduced flow capacity. So thinking, you know, sympathetically between those two bodies, um, sort of having a loss of flow at the same time. And, you know, and then, you know, just um, pumping it and then like discarding it, like into the environment was sort of a way to like kind of collapse them together into like a representational space when um, I felt like, you know, representation was really difficult at that time, at that moment. So that was sort of the, you know, the, the, the beginning of thinking about it. Yeah, I love that. Um, and, and just to go back a little bit, I know you said you sort of reached out to put together this kind of communal text of the list of fears, the script that you put together, but how did you can you sort of parse out for us, like, how did you find all the people? Were they just friends? I know um, this was, uh, this is up at Pioneer Works, and this is like a little excerpt that was not shown, but I, one of the people who contributes to the script is like a homeless woman. She uh, narrates like very specific fears, like how, you know, fears of home invasion located onto a tent, right? And I was thinking about like, did you plan it with a kind of diversity mindset or did you reach out to mothers or how did you, put together this like collective anxiety document? Yeah, I mean, the idea was to try to, you know, reach out to as many diverse groups as we could um, because, you know, people would have different voices and different concerns. And so, um, you know, one, one avenue was like the college, you know, the uh, university kids, um, uh, another was community groups, mostly in Santa Monica, because um, 18th Street 
uh, art center who um, helped me make the piece is based there. Um, and so reaching out to their community um, as well as you know the public library system. And so um, they set up a table in uh, Santa Monica and then we also went in downtown LA um, to the, the central library and set up a table and you know just like asked people you know who were going to the library if they wanted to fill out a form. Um, so you know that was maybe uh, just more open in a way, you know, uh, to get, you know, whoever was around and wanted to participate as well as social media calls, you know, like to their, you know, they were called out to their list and, uh, you know, um, uh, so it was trying to like find whatever avenues that people would want to, or could, you know, um, contribute to do so. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I also like that it's, it, is there like a degree of anonymity? to it, like I like this image of you doing almost data collection, voter registration outside of the library. Yeah, I mean, nobody had to give their name if they didn't want to. Um, we gave it, everything is being optional in terms of you know their identity, um, or people could if they felt like they wanted to. Um, you know, We have all the records of people's names who did contribute and they gave their names, um, but also you know, a lot of them are just anonymous. Um, and because we have you here, I'm wondering, did you have any observations on kind of the tendencies or the genres of people's fears? Um, you know, are there- Oh, you mean that in that are in the show? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's so broad. I mean, what I really loved about, about the collection of other people's fears, yeah. um, I mean, it's so broad, you know, it's like, it, it ranges from things like, you know, like climate change or war or death you know, to things like um, stickers on fruit and um, farting during sex, like, you know, like the, the range of people's fears and how they, you know, how they come out of your, your mind is so fascinating. Um, and it's like this fear that one would think is in, inconsequential could sit next to a fear of, you know, gargantuan proportion, you know, and huge consequence. You know, but for some reason in your mind, they're they're sort of next to each other. And, and in some ways, I think the beauty of it is it kind of, you know, brings them out together in a space um, and doesn't, you know, like doesn't judge them for, for you know, one reason or another. Um, so I, I felt like just, you know, it was, I don't know, it was so, um, you know, some of it is painful or some of it is touching, but I found it just so lovely to see the nuances of, you know, what people wanted to express. Um, and, and that was really, I thought, quite um, extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, they're also, they're remarkably funny. Um, and I'm also kind of wondering about how you use humor in your work. Um, like, do you think they're funny because of ways that you, like, and what I'm describing is you'll have an incredibly serious uh, and consequential fear and anxiety about, like, for instance, the lack of the long-term effects of arts programming being cut in the educational system. And then you'll have like the fear of the texture of goji berries. You know, you'll have these like really, really silly fears. Uh, do you think that they're just like, did you tease that out? Like how much did you edit when you made the mass document or did you just keep it kind of? No, I mean, of course I had to edit cause there were so many. Yeah. Um, and mainly what I edited was stuff that was repetitive. You know, like I think a lot of people have the fear of death you know, or the fear of pain and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I mean, of course I kept those, you know, because that everyone, everyone experiences that. Um, but I also, um, you know, tried to retain as much specificity as people had, you know, um, and in that way, maybe it's akin to poetry, you know, like the specificity makes it more real or, or more tangible, um, more, um, you know, able, we're more able to feel it somehow, like the texture of it. Um, and so, I mean, I tried to not change the language as much as possible, but to sort of fit it, you know, and also the scripts, um, like it was also determined by the length of breast pumping, you know, like, like it turned out like breast pumping time is, you know, between five minutes to 20 minutes, maybe, um, okay. you know, like maybe around 10 is an average, like that you would do. So then like, I tried to make the scripts fit into the time of people's pumping periods. So the language sort of, you know, was shaped also in relation to thinking about that. Um, 
That's so interesting. Did you give them any instructions, the performers, on like how to read, especially like after the pandemic hits, like where to film or how to frame themselves? Um, um, yeah, I mean, we would have, you know, discussions like in, in um, before the pandemic, I, I would do rehearsals or I would go and meet them and we would just read through it to make sure that the language didn't trip them up too much. Um, and I would make adjustments if they did. Um, but uh, after the pandemic, um, I mean, we would also do that, but it was really, you know, whatever space was available. Like I had, I had what was more ambitious before the pandemic to go out into the world and, you know, try to do things. Of course, everything was beyond Hong Kong and the couple things um, with the original performer were filmed like right before lockdown happened. Um, and um, so once it went online, we were really limited um, to, you know, the domestic locations of the performers. Um, so yeah, like usually it was like um, a kitchen or a, a, a spare bedroom sort of situation. I feel like, do you feel like you had a lighter touch kind of directing through Zoom or, or, or it just? I mean, I think that I didn't, you know, like my main, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about directions, but my main thing was like, oh, you know, just kind of make it, you know, really like, you know, low key, like, you know, just read like you're reading a list. And that was pretty much my main direction in person and online. So, um, you know, I didn't really like tell them too much about how they should do it. And it was a one take thing. So, you know, I was like, okay, we'll do it. And then that's it for the most part, you know, like the only person that we did multiples was with Cass in the bathtub. And I didn't show that one. Or maybe I had a, um, a, a you had a still, yeah. 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 So you know, she's the only one I did multiple ones, but they were all in different locations because you know you run out of milk and then you can't do it again for like however much time. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I feel like there's also a question, or there is a kind of like theme or a motif of automation that that emerges in these when I was watching them. Is um, you know, it's it's with all the different breast pumps and the kits that everyone unpacks and then they apply, and it's uh in some ways so different from like what we, the imagined scene of what we would imagine for breast feeding live. Um, and I think there is like, I wonder, is there something thematically similar between the difference between pumping and live feeding, which is kind of like a time and a temporal one, right? Something about an ex production and extraction and kind of the way you were filming, which is like producing all this footage uh, to play with later on. Mm. When you, know, you like, mean live breastfeeding, you mean with a baby attached? Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think the big difference because it usually takes the same amount of time is that, you know, when you have a baby attached, it's like the milk goes directly into the baby's body. So the milk is invisible. It is like, you know, um, it's directly feeding, um, the child. And when it's being pumped out before it's fed to the child, it's extracted like a resource. So you, you, you visually see the milk and it becomes separate from the, the mother's body. You know, um, uh, there's something about, you know, when the milk comes out, it becomes like, um, you know, uh, like a, a waste, right? Like it's, you know, it becomes more like spit or pee versus like nutrition. Um, or, you know, or, or the, that invisible thing, the invisible bond between mother and child, I guess. Um, so I think that without the baby attached, it becomes, um, you know, it has another value, right. Um, uh, that you, that that's different than, um, when the baby is there and it's invisible. Um, and I think it points more toward this idea of resource, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, resource value, you know, just like water, you know, we consider water a resource, you know, value, even though it's, it's just there, you know, um, yeah. or the extraction of um, materials from the earth as resource value as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I feel like, um, to some degree, like letdown was, you know, it, it yeah, exactly. It's about producing something that has a use value, but then like no place to go and is kind of stranded and mm -hmm. sort of becomes this abandoned, like residue um that has like no recipient but then I'm, I'm wondering like do you feel like you're using a different logic or like a different uh mentality with like these works in in milk debt yeah I mean I something about I think it has something to do with the idea of flowing you know flow like the breast milk flow and the language flows 
um, and in some way, like, you know, you see them, you see or hear them both kind of happening. Like there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of, um, of like energy being exchanged. And, um, and so I think of it more maybe in those terms um, of, of like, uh, like it's coming out of the body, like the language is coming out of the body. It's being made visible. The milk is coming out of the body and it's also being made visible. Um, but it's also in some way dissipating, you know, in doing so. Like, I think that there's a, a kind of a relief of having that, you know, the language come out. Like um, it's, you know, I think of it as a type of channeling, you know, like these women aren't speaking their own fears. Like almost none of it is like correlated with anyone in there, um, if any, I think. So, you know, it's really like they're channeling this and it is sort of, you know, like their, um, their bodies are kind of like moving this uh, energy through and in doing so it's, it's sort of a relief as well, like to, you know, to a service of some sort, like having it come out um, and, and letting us hear that and, and making it a visible thing. So it's separate from us too. Yeah, I love that. I feel like that was exactly what my next question was going to be is kind of there is something so unique about giving a single person the collective voice, the collective set of anxieties to like issue through their, you know, to enact and to occupy and to speak. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if like, do you feel like the past year, the past year and a half now has changed perhaps like the nature of how we engage fear, anxiety, negative emotions, things like that? Um, because I, you know, I was like, while I was watching the work, I was experiencing it as a kind of release as well. And I was wondering about the the relationship of um, like the, the relationship between like so much negative affect being expressed, right? And then feeling perhaps seen or something like that. But I'm wondering, have you seen in your own experience like a change in how we, in how you've experienced sort of fear, anxiety? And do you feel like we've had a cultural shift, something like that? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, I was working on this mainly before the pandemic. So, you know, it's just kind of like, I, I look at it as being something that's under the surface, you know, like these, these things, these emotions. And, um, and for me, it was more of just like kind of bringing them up a little bit so that they're visible. Um, but I think in the course of the pandemic, this is all kind of on the surface, right? It's kind of like all of a sudden become distilled at the top. And it, it's it's sort of visible for everyone, right? Like it's there, uh, and 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 we name it too, right? We name all these things. Like that's like the first thing you think of when you wake up, and like the last thing you think about before you go to bed. For this past year, right? For us, um, and so um, I don't know. I mean, I I I I sort of like I I think that um, uh, that you know it was always there before the pandemic, but this is just kind of like, you know, like it's collectively sort of being being brought up, right? Um, and, um, and so I also wonder like, you know, I don't think I would have made this work like now, you know, like I, I don't think that that's not my mode of working. Like, I don't think I, I would have done this, you know, it would have been like too present for me. Like this was, I did this because it, you know, I didn't feel like it was there. <laughs> You know, I was like, oh, oh, I'm a crazy, you know, like this is like, um, so in some ways I feel like there's a kind of a, a strange alignment of this, this piece and, you know, the sort of like tense, um, you know, the energy, like, like all the moving parts, like everything is happening. And, um, uh, yeah. and so, yeah, I think it's more of an alignment of the, of the piece with, you know, with our, current situation um yeah it's very timely it's that's like such a great point patty and just to jump in with a little question um patty you mentioned that you have been working on milk debt since before the pandemic and it seems like such a good time to be making a collective work when we're all sort of isolated and you know socially distanced um, but I was really curious about how this relates to your prior performance works from, you know, the 90s and the early 2000s, which it, you were the performer and you spoke like these very personal scripts about your aunt and like your own personal home life. And I'm just wondering um, sort of what's at stake for you when you 
open a performance to this group, to the collective, and you stage an open call versus doing those very individual and personal works from before? Yeah, I mean, just on a very practical level, you know, I had my child eight years ago, so I, I'm not, you know, breast pumping or breast, you know, lactating or whatever. Um, uh, I think that, you know, I used to do a lot of performance with my own body, and then I moved away from that for, you know, a good 10 years. Um, but I think that, you know, like all of those experiences um, kind of informed, you know, this work as well, because this is very much about the body. This is, you know, very much about like gendered experience of the body, expression of the body, um, you know, uh, uh, but also like, you know, thinking about land, thinking about, um, um, you know, affective emotions in, in, you know, in relation to place and um, to others. Um, and um, so I think I kind of done it, kind of kind of done it without all of these experiences, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, but I think that there is a really, like, if you even look at my like Melons piece, there's a very really direct, like, you know, aesthetic relationship to that, like a very frontal, you know, kind of like, tense energy, I guess, you know, and, and like, um, ex, ex, like, um, sort of the, this expression of things that you usually or may not express in some ways. Yeah. Right. I, I really like that answer. And that reminds me that that Melons piece has, it's not exactly, uh, your, your delivery is deadpan as it is, uh, as it is sort of in milk debt as well, but there is there was a sort of aggressiveness with which you were scooping out the um, the melon part like in your in your bra that you had stuffed in your bra and putting it in your mouth. Um, and I'm wondering about you said that you wanted the entire performance of milk debt to be low key, and is there a certain reason why you wanted that kind of affect that kind of very toned down affect versus something that was a bit more aggressive or something that really kind of communicated that sort of fear and anxiety that's within the words. Yeah, I mean, maybe low key wasn't a really good descriptor, but I mean, you know, like the, the, uh, the Melons piece is a little bit deadpan. I mean, it's just, kind of, well, no, I, I would actually say that Melons is probably more performative than the performances of Milk Debt. They're more like reading, you know, without sort of dramatic expression, you know, like, like that's kind of like what I, you know, what I told them to, you know, keep the tone is just like no dramatic expression. Because I felt like, I mean, I think I did one where the performer uh, rehearsed it more dramatically and it seemed too in line with um, the language that was coming out. It, 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 it sort of lost um, the impact of the language and the text itself because of the sort of like um, a more sort of hyper artifice um, of the um, delivery. Sort of, it needed a little bit of a, a holding back <laughs> to hear the, you know, to hear the, the drama of the language, I think. Thank you for that. Um, I feel like what I enjoyed about like Kestrel, uh, Kestrel, who's the actress who's in the bathtub, um, is kind of like two things I feel like I really enjoyed, uh, but was kind of, she gave it in this very like, uh, very slow, very theatrical voice um, and then changed her accent like halfway through. Um, and then the second thing is that she's sort of, she doesn't, she's pumping, but she's not attached to anything. So as she's like giving this oration, it just drips directly into the, you know, like the pool of water getting cloudier. And I feel like there's something interesting there with waste perhaps, but I'm wondering, did you give her sort of different notes or did she come up with that on her own? Yeah, I mean, the, specifically it was to be staged in the bathtub, you know, so that the, the milk could just drip into the element that she's sitting in. Mm -hmm. um, but it's true, I did give her like, I was like, okay, just try, you know, just try halfway through changing a little bit your tone. Um, to see what happened. I mean, you know, this, it was again, like a one-time thing. So uh, they were one-time experiments, um, but um, 
but yeah, I was interested in, you know, if she changed her tone halfway through, what, you know, what would um, happen? I mean, she has, there's other performances like in the, um, in the recording studio, for instance, that she did. Uh, but I was sort of interested also in the milk, sort of the mi milk um, and water mixing, um, mm -hmm. you know, these two kind of fluids being mixed together. Um, I mean, not that the milk is sort of uh, a contaminant, but that, you know, it clouds, it clouds the water over time. So that when it starts, it's clear, but then later, you know, it becomes a little bit hazy, a little bit, you know, um, foggy, and you can't really see through it as well. So it's a very, it's a very slight shift, but you know, it does happen. And so she's kind of stewing in this, you know, this fluid from her own body by the end. Um, I have a sort of question that's going to come. Well, it 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 relates to sort of uh, the ethics of care. Um, but it comes from Serena Caffrey, and it's uh, that she'd love to hear sort of to hear how you approach and think about collaboration and consent, especially in works that ask so much physical and emotional vulnerability from her participants. Um, do you approach collaboration with a certain set of parameters to allow those sort of working with you to feel safe or even empowered um, or you know, how do you allow people to make those meaningful choices? Um, and she's sort of, I think she's thinking in terms of contrasting it with, you know, the film industry, TV, things like that. But like, do you have a set, a way you think through those uh, frameworks? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> especially for this piece, I think I started, you know, I think I thought a lot more about it. Um, I mean, you know, like, like just said, you know, in, the, in my earlier uh, life as an artist, I did performances, you know, of my own body. So, you know, it was the uh, consent was in, implicit in it. And I, you know, and I just did whatever I wanted to. Um, but, you know, I recognized that, you know, this impulse to have someone bear themselves and do something that, you know, is incredibly intimate. Um, I think that was a lot of people's thinking was like, or a lot of people's like, um, uh, surprise was like this very intimate act being done like in open space, right? Like, or at the protest or whatever it is. And, um, and so, you know, I was really aware of that. Um, and, you know, so I, I put this call out, um, not expecting, you know, much possibly to happen. Um, and, um, but I was actually really surprised by, you know, the response of um, mothers who were lactating and, you know, that they really understood this project. Um, and like, um, because, you know, I was really, I was like, oh, this is very private, you know, like you, but there was actually quite a strong response from the people that, you know, did write back to an open call. I mean, it was really kind of an open call mm -hmm. where they, they, um, they were either having these feelings like this, this, like these thoughts of anxiety in relation to, or because of hormonally or whatever it was in this situation that they were presented with, mm -hmm. um, of like the constant anxiety and the body, right. And the sort of like the loss of control of your body to something else. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's taken over, um, hormonally, but also its function, like your pleasure, everything, right, is just taken over. So I think there was a real resonance to that. Um, and this became sort of also, you know, a space to like play out that anxiety um, on top of, you know, then the pandemic happened and that, that level of anxiety on top of, you know, the normal <laughs> level of anxiety that, you know, um, young mothers, often first time mothers have too. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I definitely was well aware of this and, um, you know, and, and, um, you know, went through, you know, how people were comfortable, what they were comfortable saying to, like, some people weren't comfortable saying certain things that people had written, you know, so removing those as well, or, um, you know, having them choose the situation that they would want to, to perform within you know, or presenting something and seeing if they were, you know, interested in that too. 
I like the idea of creating a space where people can be comfortable sort of listing these anxieties and these fears. And when I went to Pioneer Works last week um, to look at the installation in person, and I was really struck by the way that people were phrasing it. Sometimes it was very much in the present, like I am afraid of Google and Amazon and Facebook, or sometimes it was a sort of future tense, like I am afraid that I will get deported. Um, and so it seems like there is a tension between the future and how the present extends into the future. And so I'm wondering what kinds of um, imaginary spaces or even alternative futures you see projected in the work. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about the present and the future as, um, you know, like a current, like a response to a current situation versus um, a response to a future or imagined situation, right? Because fears are really about imagining, you know, because if you just focus on what is in front of you, technically, you know, or I guess you could say that you wouldn't have any fears. If you, if you, you know, like if you were to, I guess, you know, remove that sense of time or, um, or thinking of it like a meditative, meditative practice, but, you know, it's almost seems like all of the fears are about an imagined space about like a future or a something other than, you know, your body and where, you know, that very moment, um, Yeah, I mean, sometimes sometimes I think about like all the language, like everything in this piece as being like a consciousness, like it's all happening in your head, you know, like all of this is all like the space of the con of a consciousness or an imaginary in some ways too, even when they're very real, you know. And that seems like a good tie in into your previous work as well with Sean Grilla, this a uh, fictional place from, uh, I think it was a James Hilton novel that has embedded itself into our cultural consciousness um, and sort of the wandering lake in the way that these explorers from times past have been trying to find or create these imaginary spaces and link them to the real, whether through geography or through other means. Hmm. Interesting. I think that maybe, um, you know, as, as a final question, we sort of, uh, I'm curious to ask, you know, first off, like, do you, do you think of yourself um, as, you know, thinking of your contemporaries, sort of how do you relate to them? Are there particular mentors you had or those who sort of have inspired of you or people you've come up with? I'm sort of, uh, we're thinking kind of of Karen Finley um, or Barbara Cougar, uh, but, we're sort of wondering about like, you know, you're an educator now. Um, are there people who were like really formative to your to your time coming up? Yeah, I mean, I definitely looked at Karen Finley when I was in undergrad in college. Um, I think probably one of my biggest influences would be that my first teacher um, was Eleanor Anton. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I think that that's really, I mean, that, you know, the reason I do performance is probably because of her. So, you know, just as a, a, you know, like a, a really important um, mentor who, you know, I just didn't know when I was 20 years old, what was possible. <laughs> and so that was a real um, education and just even pointing to the fact that I could, you know, like express myself in this way. And, and all the things that I was thinking and feeling as, you know, this young person um, could, you know, this, this could be a manifestation of, um, of all of those thoughts, you know, be it image or language or action, um, you know, or a combination of all of those. I feel like um, in closing, I'd love to ask, you know, we have a lot of like young artists, probably art students uh, in the room and, I'm sort of wondering if you have any any ideas on like what 
the ideal like education for an, a young artist is or any advice to people who are sort of in that range you're thinking about? I know it's a huge, I know it's very large as a question, but like, would you have any small bits of advice? Oh my God. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, I mean, I do this every day and it's also really hard. <laughs> like, um, what would my advice be? I mean, I think that one one thing is that, you know, um, just thinking about the imaginaries and the future and like the present, you know, um, like I I think that it took me a long time to know what I what I do. And I mean, it's and it's constantly a moving target, but it took me years and years and years and probably decades for me to know what I do. Um, so I think that when when I was really young and I can imagine, you know, people that are young are also really impatient like I was to know what it was that I did um, and to be able to express it. And so I think that um, one of the like the the long term things of thinking is that or knowing is that, you know, it's it, like one doesn't know when one begins, you know, and that can take decades. Um, to know um, in a meaningful way. I mean, maybe I'm just really slow, but it took me, you know, like I really had to like, to learn things in a, um, uh, in an implicit way, um, what they were. Um, and so, you know, like you should cut yourself a break, you know, like don't be, like don't be so hard on yourself and be so impatient and beat yourself up because, um, you know, it'll come, but it takes time. I think that's like, you know, a really important lesson that it, did, it took me for a long time, <laughs> like to, to be like, oh yeah, right. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna sneak one more in there. You said uh, a little while back that, you know, this is work that you wouldn't make in the present. This is work that's like, so of the pre-pandemic, pre, you know, of that moment. And I'm, I'm wondering like, what is it that you're working on now? What are the ideas that are really exciting to you now? If you could tell us just like a sneak. Yeah, so I <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I am in a collaborative, um, a collaboration with um, a feminist phenomenal, phenomenologist, uh, eco-feminist writer mm -hmm. and uh, a scientist who uh, is a veterinary pathologist. And this, like I didn't know either one of these people before the pandemic started. And, um, but now uh, we are collaborating and we um, meet on Zoom. But we're all in different uh, countries in different time zones. Where is everyone? Meet... What's that? Where is everyone? Um, well, one person is in Sweden and the other one used to be in Australia, but is now in Canada. And then we also have another collaborator in Hong Kong, a part-time collaborator. And we all meet on Zoom every week. And then we have um, virtual retreats to like, talk about what we do or what we what we're doing and um so it's actually really interesting and probably something i would never have done before like the pandemic and my digital life um in this space um and so it's been really fascinating to not only like work in a completely different way but also to feel like a student of somebody else's practice so that's yeah that's what i'm doing <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, and maybe Jess, that's a beautiful place to move to questions. Perfect. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Malvika. Our first question comes from Lynn Crawford. Lynn, you should be able to unmute. Thank you. Um, what a wonderful presentation. And I feel sort of like, um, looming over this whole issue or under it or permeating through it is this sense um, when you're breastfeeding and the possibly the toxins that you're putting in your body that you're not intentionally putting in your body, but through the water you drink, or you mentioned earlier, so many things that we are aware of and you're feeding your baby with this and you might be killing the baby but you, if you don't feed the baby, then you're killing the baby. So it puts the, the, the person in this impossible situation. And I felt like that was the undercurrent of that little bit of the film that you've showed is that impossibility, potentially. Mm -hmm. Was that? 
Well, I mean, I, I love that, um, uh, that observation because it is true. Like breast milk is, you know, incredibly toxic. And so if you were to find it in the supermarket, it would, you know, it would have warning labels on it most likely because of how toxic our environment is. Well, and for different women in different yeah. classes and different access, it's probably more so. Right. And less depending on where you live. Right. And your circumstance. Yeah, exactly. That it is. So there is, yes, there is, you know, but there is that impossibility. Um, and, you know, it's, if you do it, if you don't do it, uh, it's kind of like being stuck um, in a, in a situation that, that feels like it can't be fixed. Yeah. It, it almost seemed like this underlying menace potential you know, instead of this love, you know, it could be this potential menace. And I just, I'm not sure if that was intentional, but I really felt that um, in addition to all the other more traditional things that are mentioned and, and that was, that were portrayed, but thank you so much. Yeah, no, I love that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lynn. Our next question comes from Deanna Lee. Deanna, you should be able to unmute. Hello. Um, thank you, Jess and Malvika and everyone else at the rail, Nick, everyone. Um, and thank you, Patty. This is really, really interesting. And I um, am thinking about what, I'm just curious about what your thoughts are regarding your current work in relation to your much earlier work that you've made in collaboration with your parents. Um, that I, I think, I mean, it must have been decades ago now, but I just, it, it, it made Two. such an impression on me um, that, you know, you were doing this very physical work um, and very personal work, and, and, you know, with, with people you're related to. And I don't know what your relationship is like with your parents, but I couldn't imagine doing that with my parents, right? So um, it's, it's, it was just fascinating to me. And then also just sort of like, how the body um, and bodily fluids and fluid exchange, you know, how those themes sort of like uh, relate to this particular work in particularly regarding your mother. Um, did she have any input into this piece or, yeah, I guess things around that. Yeah, um, and that's many different components. Um, <laughs> I mean, that was like two, de two decades ago. I think we did that piece in 2000. Um, and so, yeah, that was 20 years ago. Um, but I see the correlations that you're thinking about, like the ideas of, you know, kinship and parental child relations. Um, and also I think about also maybe ideas, um, of sacrifice, um, you know, generational sacrifice, like, um, and how, you know, the, the breast milk also perhaps stands in for that in some way. Um, and also just think, thinking about like, just about my mom and, um, uh, you know, I, I didn't actually, before I started the piece, I didn't really, um, you know, uh, talk to her about this, um, this project um, or the process so much. Um, but, you know, like I was born uh, at the time when, um, you know, uh, women did not, breastfeed like it was not done you know it was like the generation of formula is best or uh, you know and so um so we have you know like that relationship didn't happen it was um you know uh the the birthing and then the also the the feeding you know was very very um distant um but yeah I mean but that's interesting that you bring that up and that you make me think about that <laughs> because I think about this idea of kinship you know and sacrifice in milk debt as well um, uh, of the, you know, of the women that are pumping, um, and, you know, and the language that, you know, the language that is coming out and how that's related. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Deanna. That was a great question. Um, next up, we have our very own Catherine Olson from The Rail. Catherine, you should be able to unmute. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Um, and thank you so much, Patty. Um, what I was thinking about is that these lists of fears seem to almost act as like an analog or like 
a marking of time of like this time of the pandemic, like some of these fears would be the same in a hundred years, like death, um, but a lot of them would be different. And I guess I'm wondering if this sort of marking of time is something you think about in your process. And I also can't help but like relate this concept to landscape and erosion and marking of time that way. Um, but yeah, I just love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that these fears do reflect the period that we're in. Um, I mean, a lot of the fears were collected before pandemic started, but we re we reopened um, and I made um, new performance, a new performance after, um, uh, specifically after pandemic began, that's, you know, it's recorded on Zoom or something. Um, so I think that, you know, it reflects like the general, period, but also very specifically this moment. Um, and um, I think, you know, like just what you had mentioned about marking of time or of land. Um, I also think that the, the idea of the ritual also marks time. And, you know, I think that a lot of my work, my previous work does, you know, work with ideas of ritual. And, um, and so in that way, you know, this ritual of the collective, you know, breast pumping and speaking of fears is, you know, sort of, you know, um, a way to look at um, what's happened now. And I, I knew from the beginning that, you know, it would be very specific um, even before pandemic, like it would just be like sort of a snapshot um, and not like universal in, you know, in like a hundred years. Um, but yeah, but thinking about time was actually, you know, quite important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, our next question comes from the Rails Nick Bennett. Nick, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, Patty and Malka and Jess for this conversation. It has been lovely to spend our Monday evening slash afternoon talking about uh, lactation. Um, <laughs> So thank you, Patty, so much for being here. Um, I hope my question doesn't sort of go too far into the deep end, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, I'm kind of, you know, I'm thinking about milk debt and I'm thinking about some of your earlier works and I couldn't help but think of that, um, the book by Amelia Jones, Body Art, Performing the Subject. And she kind of has this motif throughout the book that she likens performance to narcissism. Um, and she's kind of, she starts with um, uh, perf narcissism sort of from a, a feminist perspective um but in it she says something that uh that the this narcissism as manifested in body art um through a fixation on performing the self leads to uh, an exploration of i don't want to sound like i'm just reading a quote but I'm, maybe a little bit uh leads to an exploration of and an implication of the other um so the self turns itself is turns inside out projecting its internal structures of identification and desire outward. Um, and so from that point, narcissism interconnects the internal and the external self. So that's sort of convoluted way of talking about narcissism. I'm, I'm curious how, you know, like for here in milk debt, this sort of internal thing that you work with other people, there is a very internal and external way that, you know, as, as a, as a woman, all of these people are sort of sharing it. And as a viewer, people are sharing it. Um, I'm curious if, you know, you in a way sort of relate to that definition at all of narcissism and how that's related to performance and how that's related to the body and as an artist and how you approach your work. And um, if that has changed at all over, over the course of your career from, from some of your earlier work to your work right now. I mean, I guess I'll just speak more specifically about this project and I mean, what, how I would maybe like reconfigure her definition of, of narcissism for like the collective group within which, you know, the project unfolds. Um, because, you know, I think about this idea of the ex internal, external and like sort of like the turning inside out that you talked about. Um, but in this situation, it's kind of a collective, you know, internal, internal that gets externalized. Um, for instance, you know, in the piece, um, the, the snippet that you saw, but also the installation, um, oh, which we didn't show images of, but um, there is like text that rolls, right? And then there's like other ones where there's performers performing those lists, right? So 
on one level, um, you, you become a witness to someone else performing that language. So you, you witness them, you see them, you are, they, they are external to you, you're external to them, but it's like a mirror, right? There's a recognition and um, the act of um, bearing witness. And on the other hand, there's the text scrolling, right? And the text is written from first person because you know people wrote them for themselves. So, but as a viewer, uh, you read those lists, um, which are in first person, and there's the possibility of them being internalized, uh, where you become the I, right? And those fears become your fears. And reading, of course, happens in your mind. So it's about an internal process. So within the piece itself, there is a reverberation between an externalized witnessing and an internalized reading um, of an embodying of the list. Um, so I, I sort of, you know, can see this, you know, like, moving back and forth of the internal and external within the, this particular piece and the strategies used in the piece that probably relate to narcissism, but, you know, sort of turn it in another angle. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you, Nick. Um, and Serena, I believe Amelia Jones's book is called Body Art. Um, our last question for today comes from Kwame Opokuduku. You should be able to unmute your mic. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Patty. Um, thank you, Malvika. Thank you, Jess. This was a really lovely talk. Um, my question was, do you ever read things that might be called escapist literature, um, whatever that might be for you? And do you rationalize it or embrace it? And also associated, do you sometimes find that you have to limit that urge? Wait, what was the last part? Do you sometimes find that you have to limit that urge? To, of reading escapist literature? Uh, yes. <laughs> or uh, I, I guess immersing yourself in it, if you do. Yeah, I'm always looking for escapist literature. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but peppered within that, I, you know, uh, I guess I read serious literature. Um, I, you know, like, it's hard for me to like, separate sometimes, because I feel like, you know, what might be considered escapist becomes, um, becomes something that's very real or that I latch onto in terms of, you know, like, I mean, when you say escapist, I guess also, you know, is it that it's like um, removing from my, removing me from my current reality or is it, you know, like a uh, pulp or, you know, or sort of like lower kind of um, uh, on the totem pole of, you know, like what, what we, sh what one should be reading. Um, so I guess, you know, like I think about all of those things as, you know, like, Yes, yes to all of them. Um, and, um, uh, but I also think that, you know, like they're, it's just as important to me, <laughs> um, you know, and I try to reach out to like all different, uh, I don't know, I guess, forms of writing um, to draw from them as well. You know, just like this idea of like fears, you know, like list, a list of fears you know, it feels like really throwaway or something that, you know, it could be, you know, deemed un unimportant or a, a just like a, a passing thought. Um, but I'm interested in that idea that th these are like passing thoughts that we're always having, you know, that are kind of like overtaking us and, you know, but also just constantly running in the background of whatever it is we're doing simultaneously, um, but sort of like, you know, coping or coexisting with them. Um, and so like, how do you sort of, you know, um, uh, bring that, you know, bring its importance out to, you know, to like show that, that, that these things that we kind of shove, you know, just like maybe escapist literature could be like shoved at the bottom of the backpack, you know, that it's also there. And it's also, you know, something that's an important, um, uh, important to realize that these are all angles. These are all like, you know, parts, facets. Thank you everyone who asked questions today. So moving to poetry, at The Rail we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. 
And I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, G.E. Schwartz, to the proverbial stage. G.E. Schwartz, who has studied with Irish-American poet John Montague and Joseph Brodsky, was an original member of Solomon's Ramada, as well as Faking Trains. He's the author of Only Others Are Poems, published by Legible Press, Odd Fish, World, and Living in Tongues. G.E., you should be able to unmute. Greetings and greetings from one Howard lands in upstate New York, um, which is uh, the, the unceded lands. Uh, I have two poems tonight. And, um, and uh, the first one is called All Our Pre-Mothers Speak. And it's for Patty Chang. Hmm. And it begins, it begins with a quote, uh, a great disorder is an order. Wallace Stevens, connoisseur of chaos. We are spread wide, far on the other side of the seas. As we ebb in lives not our own, our blood flows on. Like a milk mist lifting, we fade. We no longer are those who, through new eyes, see the green, the vein, the flower, the trees, rhizomatic and rap conversation. We are an echo you do not hear. Who? gone from ourselves, are near your here and now of a desperate elsewhere. We are with you. In your first love age old, the untold as we hold our breath, at first easy, then gasping, then struggling, at the breaking point, we speak to you. Listen, there is a stream flowing that flowed before all first beginning of bounding forms, circumscribing prototype and protozoan. The passive permeable seas obey, reflect, rise, and fall as forces of the supermoon and wind draw this way or that its wild way to waves. But this mutable water holds no trace of crest or ripple or maelstrom of whirlpool. The waves break, scattering in a thousand instantaneous drops that fall in sphere and ovioid. Film spun bubbles upheld in momentary equilibrium, strain and stress in the ever changing woven net of stars. Now in flux, the first bounding membrane forms. It forms like a memory trace of your preceding state. We are all linked. Organic chain holds against current and tide its microcosms of your disobedience. What first causes impresses with inherent being, entities, selves, vortices, amoeboid, pulsing or ciliate, this flow, see it now as a form of thought. Pause, slow. Know what is born from this primal matrix. This delicate tissue of life retains your stigmata, your trace, your signature. It endures, withstands the deathward streaming, but it still welcomes all solving, dissolving, undoing, returns, losses, losing itself, bound past your body, identity, memory, the state of unknowing, unbeing, because it is the flux that precedes all life, ceasing to double, double the trouble of the fleeting flow of a dream, hope and despair of your transient, perilous selving. And um, the next poem um, is the, uh, a novel of us, and I dedicate it to my, my friend and, and publisher, in memoriam, Michael Rosenthal. This novel of us is remembrance of a lakeside park called Where When, where former poplars spiraled in their confessional susurrations and our ageless others played at their lengths of years singing under the chorus of sun and how all of this 
will be never now. This novel of us clangs along with its plot within the systems of darkness of hometowns with the mundane traffic veneers, a surface over talibans of our brokenness, our crenulated hoaxes, over our schist, our niece afforded by unconscious love and despair. This novel of us takes us to the streets, white as lint, dissolving all arguments, knowing and voiding all differences, discarding the plaster cast of footprints, our claimed once sugarcoating all we know of our unchecked wind of time when face to face we were dispelled, untitled by world. This novel of us contains our flesh, our lifted love, our need to saddle up and ride out under the severe of Corinth skies, to arch our backs to that thrust of that mythology as marble, ever marble, is permitted to absorb the sweat of that lust until we're finally led down porticos of black columns. This novel of us brims with magical thinking, grafted with the desire to be ordinary and as easy as rings, sifting through sands woven with doubts, clouding, skewing our facade of steadiness, boxing us, deterring us from flapping, spreading wings to rise, which is all we ever did. This novel of us is how we continue in flensed flesh, scrubbed clean of our traced souls, in heavy raiment that we may rise, clearing ever wind lash heights of oft raptured skies who call we below attached still to world to meet the light, to rinse the eyes shut and to blaze with those before us. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the pink supermoon. Thank you so much, GE. And thank you, Patty. Thank you, Malvika. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today and for all of your questions. This was a lovely and very intimate conversation. The Rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit dedicated to providing free and accessible criticism and community events like this one. If you enjoyed today's events, please consider making a donation to keeping the Rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Mark Stevens, Annalyn Swan, and Phyllis Tuchman. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Jory Graham. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much, Patty. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Malvika and Jess. Thanks, GE. Thank you. Wonderful planting moon for all those gardeners out there. Especially seeds. Especially seeds. Well, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Bye from Brooklyn. Thank you so much. Good night, all. Happy Monday. Happy Monday.